Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about animal behavior. Uh, if you study animal behavior, you're called an ethologist. And so that's ethology, which is the study of animal behavior. But know this, when you study animal behavior, there's a wide continuum of behaviors. And it's going to move all the way from innate behaviors. So this turtle, a sea turtle is born, and it's going to immediately head out to sea. And so these are things that you have from day one. It's a continuum all the way up to complex learn behavior. Like this chimpanzee you can see is thinking something uh, pretty profound, I would imagine. And so let's work our way from the innate all the way up to the learned behavior. The first thing uh, that you should know is that an instinct is basically anything that you have from day one. And so if you ever take your finger and put it up next to a baby's hand, the baby will grab onto that which you might think, that's really cute. But if you put it next to their foot, they'll grab onto you as well with their toes. And so this is a grasping reflex that all babies have from day one. And so that's genetically programmed into them. And you can think about it just from an evolutionary perspective. Babies who weren't able to hold on mom uh, over our evolutionary history ended up you know, hitting the ground and not making it very far. And so an example of this in the animal kingdom, we could have the hognose snake. So the hognose snake, basically, when you come up and threaten it, it will spit at you and try to uh, intimidate you but it doesn't have poison. And so basically, if you get too close and mess with it too much, it'll turn upside down, its head will get thrown back, its tongue comes out, and it starts to ooze like the smell of dead, decaying flesh. Uh, okay, so that's cool, but they have it from day one. In other words, once a hognose snake is born, the, mi the minute they uh, hatch out of the egg, they have this behavior. So it's clearly an instinct. Next, we have what are called fixed action patterns. Fixed action patterns Basically, when you have a stimuli, it's a series of actions you're going to take to completion. And so it's easier to understand if I give you an example. So this is a Greylack goose. Basically, they'll sit on their eggs and incubate their eggs. But if you ever take one of their eggs out and put it next to the nest, they'll ba basically take their their beak and they're going to pull that back into the nest and so they can sit on it. And you might think that's a really smart goose. Um, however, if you take like a billiard ball, something that you play pool with and put it next to their nest, they're going to pull that in. Or a light bulb, they'll pull that in and sit on it. And you might think that's a stupid goose, but if you think about it, through their history, they never really needed to evolve a better way to discriminate between eggs. And so that works well. And there probably wasn't, back in the day, a scientist replacing all their eggs with uh, light bulbs. And so they didn't need to evolve any kind of a better uh, method. Now, you might think, we don't do that. Humans don't show fixed action patterns. But you do. If somebody ever sees you and you recognize somebody but you weren't looking for them, you'll go like this to them. So you'll be like, hey, how's it going? And when you do that, what you're doing is lifting your head up. Your eyebrows are going to come up. And you do what's called an eyebrow flash. And you don't even know that you're doing it. But once you see somebody do it to you, then you have to do it back to them. Try this out. I do it on students all the time. It's really fun. Next, we have what's called imprinting. Imprinting is basically not learned behavior, but it's going to be something that ha happens during what's called a critical period in your lifetime. And so in geese, basically they'll imprint on their mother and they'll follow her around uh, until they become older. And so this guy, Conrad Lawrence, basically realized that if he could take the mother out and he could take it, her place during this critical period of time, then they would follow him. So no matter where he would walk, they would just follow him, thinking that he's mom. Salmon will do the same thing. So they imprint on the chemical smell in the creeks or the creeks that they're in. And so as they go out to the ocean and come back again, they can find it. But it has to occur during this critical period of time. Next, as we move our way up, is what's called associative learning. You're probably familiar with Pavlov and Pavlov's dog. Basically, what happens is you start to associate two stimuli, and so or one stimuli with some effect. And so, for example, he would work with dogs where he would ring the bell, then he would give them some meat powder, and then he would measure. You can see he's measuring dog spit right here. And so he would basically ring the bell, give them meat powder, ring the bell, give them meat powder. And so they started to associate ringing the bell with eating. And so pretty soon he could just ring the bell, and then they would start to salivate. And so around here we have bears in the spring that come out. And basically what they'll do is raid all the bird feeders. And so they're associating that food with that location. And so years later they can come back to that same place. If you don't want them to do that, you have to remove the stimuli. You have to remove the bird feeder.
Next, we have what's called trial and error learning. Trial and error learning, the, the person who's most associated this with, with this is B.F. Skinner, and he developed something called the Skinner Box. So this is kind of an example of that. You put a rad in here, maybe some lights and a little uh, lever. And so basically, you can teach them. So let's say when the green light comes on, the rat, if he happens to just touch the lever, then food comes out. And so basically, you can teach them really complex behavior using this trial and error. It's kind of how we train dogs, same way. One of my favorite stories of this, I think his name is Joe. Joe Klein developed what's called a crow vending machine. If you just put crow vending machine into YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, what he did is he used trial and error learning to basically build a vending machine. He'd put uh, quarters around it and then teach the crows that if they put the quarters inside a slot, then food would come out. And so basically you train them through a series of steps and then let them go and they'd fly around town, find coins, bring them back, and then he got the money and then they would get the food. So we call this operant conditioning when you're teaching them to do that through trial and error. Next as we move up is habituation. Habituation is when you get the same stimuli over and over and over again and you eventually learn to ignore it. And so this is a prairie dog and when a hawk comes by or a snake they'll basically make this scream and so all the other prairie dogs will head under underground. And so what humans, uh, what happens with humans is if you go around prairie dogs they'll do the same thing. But if you don't harm them and you keep going around prairie dogs eventually they'll habituate to that and they'll ignore it and they won't make those calls. Likewise, if we have a sea anemone here and you put uh, shrimp, for example, on a sea anemone tentacle, they'll eat it. And you put shrimp and they'll eat it. But you put a chunk of plastic there, they'll eat it. And put plastic there and they'll eat it. And put plastic there and then they'll just ignore it. So they're not getting that food hit. And so eventually they'll habituate to the presence of that plastic. And you can see evolutionarily why this is important. You don't want to always have the same response to every stimuli. Next we move up to what's called observational learning. Observational learning is watching another organism and you can see how we're headed up that continuum in, in, towards learned behavior. Observational learning is simply watching another organism and mimicking that. And so one of my favorite organisms is the octopus and basically when you put octopus in an aquarium and you give them a problem, in this case there's a bottle with a lid on the top and they have to open up that lid and then get to the food inside it, about half the octopi will be able to do that, half won't, won't be able to solve the problem. But if you put an octopi in an adjacent tank, it will watch this one and it will learn how to do that. Right here we have a researcher sticking his tongue out and then a little macaque uh, monkey is going to stick his tongue out as well. And so a really cool area of research is into what is called a mirror neuron. And so mirror neurons it sounds a lot like a motor neuron, but a motor neuron al allows me to do something like touch myself right here on the head. But a mirror neur neuron is different. And so if you watch me take my finger and touch myself right there on the head, watch me do that. As I do that, a certain percentage in you of the neurons that allow me to touch my head right here, a certain number of those neurons, I remember it being something like 10%, are also firing in you. And so by you watching me, you're actually learning how to do it by practicing those neurons. And we find this in mammals, and it's I think it's a pretty cool area of research. And then the last thing I want to finish with is insight. We tend not to see insight lower down this continuum, but let me give you an example, let me give you a problem. This is called the candle problem. And so basically think of it this way, you're given matches, tacks, and a candle, and I want you to stick the candle to a wall and then light it. And so if I were to give you these objects and put you in a room, you'll eventually try a number of things. You might try to heat the candle up on the side and stick it to the wall. Trust me, it won't work. You could stick tacks in and try to balance it on there. It's also not going to work. You could heat the tax, still nothing. And so basically you would eventually come up using insight with something like this, hopefully. And so you would have to dump out the tax and use the tax as a candle holder. And so it takes a while for you to solve this. And some organisms would never be able to do that because they don't have what's called insight. But chimpanzees do. If I were to put a chimpanzee in a room, put a banana up on the uh, ceiling, give a bunch of boxes in here where the chimpanzee couldn't reach, and just give him or her time, basically he'd be able to solve this problem by stacking the boxes up and getting the banana. And so this is insight. And we don't tend to see insight in really lower level organisms that don't have highly developed brains. But crows, for example, can solve really complex problems. Chimps and primates can solve problems. Dolphins, small tooth whales can solve that. And so um, what we find as far as intelligence goes is that you don't need to be intelligent until you really start living socially. And once you start living socially, you have to look out for yourself, but you also have to look for everybody that's around you. And so that's where we get high-level intelligence showing up. But we're just smart enough uh, to get by. 
and hopefully you're a little smarter now. So I hope that's helpful.